I certainly appreciate these remarks that have been made. I count myself to be a very fortunate preacher. I started preaching under the uh, guiding eye of Brother Joe Blue. I still have the letters that he wrote to me, and especially some of my first debates that I was going into, Brother Blue thought that I might not do too well. So he wrote me a letter, giving me the points to use in debate and how to carry them out, and that meant a, a whole lot. And so I, just at the end, uh, when those preachers were going out, so to speak, and now I live in a day when we have young gospel preachers like Brother Tom Waycaster and uh, many of the school are preaching here. And so I'm such a fortunate man, having been associated with them and the preachers of today. So I'm glad to, to be with you. Especially am I glad to be in this area, to be with Brother Perry Coffin again. He and his good wife have meant so much to me, as through the years. You're very fortunate to have people like this in your community. And if you're ever looking to someone to honor... I think there's a good man to honor. He's done so much for Christ, traveled so many miles, and done so much good. And to be with Brother John Bannister again, and uh, Brother Roy Lanier, Jr., and uh, Brother Rogers, and so many of you just to seeing you again is indeed a great pleasure. Brother Four Wallace and I, we have bookshop just about all over the United States. In fact, uh, my wife and I, right after we were married, Brother Wallace came, wanted to know if we'd been on a honeymoon. I said, oh, yes. He said, well, get in the car, get your bags, as I'm taking you up to a place for the week. So we practically spent our honeymoon with Foy Wallace. So <clears throat> of all the books that Foy had, I just about have the duplicates in my library of some 6,000 books today. I'll never forget, I'm going to digress a little bit. For most of my speech, you can see it in the book. I'm going to talk to you about it. And uh, But Brother Wallace, you know, uh, sometimes he didn't preach the length of sermons that you allow here. Forty-five minutes was not a start. So <clears throat> some years ago in preaching in uh, Hayward, California, we invited Brother Wallace to come and engage in a meeting. Brother Wallace wanted to come a specific week, and no other week would work. But we suggested a week, but he wouldn't take that one. The reason we didn't want it that particular week, that he wanted to come, because the school teachers uh, had some sort of function, and they would be needed schoolhouses. But Brother Wallace says, now I want to come that week, and said, that's it, and I want to come. So we wrote back, and we said, Brother Wallace, and now if you will come, we have to have a short service, one evening. Now, the rest of them can be any length, but one evening, it has to be short. We suggested 40 minutes. So uh, Brother Wallace says, I've never done that before. But he said, since Joe Gilmore wants me to do that, he says, I'll try to preach 40 minutes. Uh, would you know that particular night the baptistry started gurgling? We had a new pump put in. And uh, all the noise while Brother Wallace was uh, preaching. So I beckoned to one of the deacons to go and cut it off. So instead of going to the back where he ought to have gone and cut it off there, he went to the main switch, cut it off. Well, that got the clock. <laughs> Three hours and ten minutes later, <clears throat> Brother Wallace looked down to me and he said, Joe, there's something wrong. He says, I don't know what it is. But he said, something is wrong. He said, three or four families have left. And he said, there's something wrong. He said, how long have I preached? He said, Brother Wallace, you've preached three hours and ten minutes. He said, well, I thought I had a lot of time. I was watching that clock. And he said, when I preach, I have to have a clock. When it came my time to say something, I suggested that maybe he needed a calendar. And you know, I had to explain that <laughs> to Brother Wallace all week, what I meant by a calendar. Well, I'm glad I knew for Wallace. These Wallaces have been good to me, been good for the church. 
Glenn and I have preached all over the United States, held debates together out in California when the church was young, and uh, they didn't pay preachers very much. Glenn and I would have to go out in the debate and have to sleep together, and I'd have to hear him snore all night. So uh, we defended the gospel together many some years ago in California. You know, Glenn uh, says that he never had a debate. The fact of the matter is he's never out of one. He was always getting something stirred up, and then he had his brother G.K. or Joe Gilmore. And so if G.K. wasn't at hand, then I had to take the debates, but Glenn said he had never had one. So then we came down to G.K. I think of all the people that I've met. I'm glad that you honored G.K. Wallace. If ever a man has done good in the church of our Lord and Savior, it's been Brother Wallace. I learned how to preach some ways from Brother Wallace, and I'd like to pass it on to you. Brother Max Miller, who's taken a number of classes with G.K. Wallace, said this is the way G.K. tells young preachers how to preach. He says, uh, start low, go slow, take aim, rise high, to the spirit-wed form, and end in a storm. Now, those of you who know G.K. Wallace, he preaches just exactly like that. I think I've got them all down except that last one, end in a storm. <clears throat> Haven't been able to quite accomplish that. But Brother Wallace has really meant a lot to the brotherhood. One time <clears throat> he was in a meeting, called on Brother Wallace to lead in prayer. One of the elders of the congregation thought that you had to kneel when you prayed or be prostrate. You couldn't stand up, couldn't pray standing. Well, Brother Wallace didn't know that. So uh, they called on Brother Wallace to pray. He jumps up on the platform, stands and leads prayer. Well, this good brother, just soon as Brother Wallace finished, raised his finger toward Brother Wallace and said, Brother Wallace, you sin, you stood to pray. Brother Wallace pointed his finger right back at him and said, You sinned, you peeped. Which is the worst, peeping or standing? <clears throat> I'll never forget one occasion, uh, Brother Wallace. <clears throat> he was in Kansas in a meeting. So uh, he had been preaching about ten minutes. And then comes a man with a pallet, and he puts the pallet down the floor, and he'd gone out the car first to get this, and he brings it in, all of this disturbance, and puts that pallet down. Then he gets two children, lays them down, puts a blanket over them, and pats them, and he starts to sit down. G.K. just jumps off of the platform, hadn't missed a verse, still preaching, still going right on. Ran back, shook that man's hand, said, now you can get up out, take that pallet. Take it right back in the car and put it where you got it. Said, my name is G.K. Wallace, not Foy. <clears throat> so these Wallaces have been something for us. I've been here all week, that is, since Monday night. I've been waiting around to preach this one uh, sermon. I kind of feel like that uh, piccolo player in the symphony orchestra. He only had one note to play. And when he got to it, he blew it. <clears throat> so you've had so many fine speakers, you really didn't need to send to California and get me. But away, I'm glad you did. I like to put in uh, what I believe for the gospel of Christ. I like to make a stand for Christ, the church, and the Bible. Now today, we're, I want to say, though, that my sister is here and her husband from Oklahoma. Uh, it isn't often you get them out of Oklahoma, but they're here today, so I'm glad they're here. We have uh, studied in the Bible concerning uh, Jesus Christ, and we're well acquainted with him in so many different aspects. He is our Lord and Savior. But we're acquainted uh, with Jesus as mediator, prophet, and priest, and king. But we're also acquainted with Jesus. We see him in another light in Luke 2 and verse 49. He said, I must be about my father's business. 
So Jesus, our Lord, was a businessman. He respected uh, the business world and sought to regulate it by his divine law. And let me tell you also that Jesus so respected the business world when he was here that uh, before his public ministry, he supported himself and made his keep by being a carpenter. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 55, we learn, Is not this the carpenter's son? We turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? And then from the parables of Jesus, we also learn some other things. We learn that uh, Jesus Christ elevated the business world. We see that he highly respected it, because in Matthew 13, verse 45, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Well, a merchant man is a businessman. Dropping down to verse 47 of this same chapter, we have Jesus speaking of a net, a fisherman's net. So by looking here, we can see of the fisherman's net, Peter, James, and John were fishermen. They derived their livelihood by this trade. Thus we can see again that Jesus has elevated and respected the business world. In Ephesians 4, in verse 1, Paul talked of living right, the Christian life, and called it a vocation. And then he asked that we live worthy of it. And so as important as the various businesses are, the trades are, they're not essential as doing business for God. We must be like Jesus. Jesus did business for God. And likewise, we must follow in the steps of our Lord. I have been assigned evangelism in the marketplace. Well, in the marketplace is where we find the crowd, where we find the people. It is here that we make the greatest contact with people. And so we need then to think about how to evangelize the marketplace. There are three things that we're going to be thinking about. The capital on hand, and we'll talk about the rules of business, and then the profits. First of all, what do we have to invest in this firm and this company of the Lord doing business for God? First of all, we have to invest, I have to invest myself. For over 45 years, I've given to preaching the gospel of Christ, and I'm not ashamed of it. If I could do it over again, I would do the same things. I'd rather be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ than to be president of the United States of America. That is the way I feel and the honor that I attach to being a minister of the gospel of Christ. In Romans 12 and verse 1, present your bodies unto God a reasonable service. Second Corinthians, the eighth chapter, we read of the Macedonians. They first gave of their own selves, and then they gave of their means beyond their power. You know, today we ought to have the words, be born again, over every ledger book, over every door of every business. I'd like to call to mind a passage of Scripture this time, Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. I wonder how many of you have really studied this passage of Scripture. What does it mean? The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. I have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord saved me. Since I have accepted his invitation, I must turn around to some other individual and I must say, come. This is the obligation that saved people have to the unsaved. May I ask, to how many people have you said come to lately? Is there anyone in this audience who is here because of you? Are you able to point your finger toward any person and say, if it were not for me, that person would not be a Christian? 
Well, you need to read Revelation 22, verse 17 again. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Well, then again, we need to present every grace which God uh, has given. If you have little faith, use it. Let it grow. Suppose your love is weak. Cultivate it and let it grow. Again, you have a mind to invest to the Lord. Let us read Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all of thy mind. Business people, as a rule, have good minds. It would be good to find in elderships over the country men uh, in the eldership who are businessmen. Of course, they need the other qualifications, but we need businessmen, some of them in the eldership in congregations throughout the land. You ask why. Well, businessmen know how to organize. They have good minds. And so if it, even if they're not in the eldership, they ought to present themselves available to the local elderships and let them know that they're willing to help them to organize, to take the gospel of Jesus Christ into the marketplaces. A man who is starved doesn't need food any longer. A man in the day of judgment who is lost doesn't need the gospel any longer because the gospel can't help him and the gospel can't save him there. Now, not only do we need to offer our minds, but we have something else in capital. We may offer our bodies. Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. So many places teach the value of the body. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. We learn that the body houses the Holy Spirit. It's the temple of God, said Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. I look at the body then as a movable temple, something wherein the principles of God dwells in that body. There are a lot of people today willing to give their minds to the Lord. They'll invest their minds. But they want to keep their bodies. Just recently in a large congregation in California, the summons went out that we're going to do personal work, going to knock on doors, and that's something that so many people just scared to death, afraid they'll knock on a door and some giant's going to walk out with a club and hit them over the head. Well, you know how many people volunteered out of a large congregation? Only 20 people showed up, reported for duty, to go and to knock doors and arrange for Bible classes and to accomplish good for the cause of Christ in that city. So here were people willing to use their minds, study, to get the Bible right. They don't want anything wrong preached, and that's good. But the same congregation refused to offer their bodies to go out to do personal work and to let men know about the Christ. Then again, we need to offer our time. Jesus showed that time is valuable, John 9 and verse 4. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh, for no man can work. If you and I could just understand the various facets of time, I think it would scare us, frighten us, revive us, make us humble. There are some things about time that we need to understand. You can't stop it. I don't know a thing that you can do to stop it. You can't even slow it down. Think of all those birthdays you'd like to forget. You can't even slow time down. You can't speed it up. And once you have used it, you cannot recall it. And time is valuable. And time is life. And time is no respect of persons. And time is today. If you just think all of those poems over, it frightens you a little bit, doesn't it? it? Scares you some. Revives you. Makes you think. Well, also, we need to invest not only time, but we need to invest our money. 
There's a lot of money today that needs to be cleansed. I'm afraid that you don't understand exactly what I mean. You can't go and wash it. But there's a way to cleanse your money. I'd like to read Luke 11, verse 41. Jesus said, Give alms of all that you possess, and behold, all things are clean unto you. The sea, known as the Dead Sea, is perhaps the foulest place of all the earth. If you were flying in an airplane and fly over the Dead Sea, you would be about 1,500 feet below sea level. The Jordan River runs through the Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee teems with life and beauty. But the Dead Sea, fish are not in it. Fowls do not swim on the surface of the water. It's a foul place. Why? The Jordan River pours out of Galilee. It pours into the Dead Sea, and there it stays. You don't want to eat anything in the Jordan or in that uh, area of the Dead Sea. Glenn and Wallace, Glenn Wallace and I, ate a banana each near that area, and we were sick a week. Foulest place of all the earth. But what makes the Dead Sea dead? That's a good question. Because it receives, it does not give. And that only means that its pollution is increased. Now, how about us? The way to cleanse our fortunes, the way to cleanse our money, is by giving of it. And I'm afraid that a lot of members of the church have never learned this lesson. People who just receive money and keep it and do not give it to the cause of Christ you're only increasing your pollution. I'm afraid that many members of the church do not understand the money question. I've been preaching the gospel over 40 years. I've only found one man that ever made confession that he hadn't given enough to the Lord. And on that day, we received a large check. He apologized to the Lord. Did you ever apologize to the Lord? This man did. Gave a check. I apologize. I have robbed the Lord. Well, on the first day of the week, we're to lay by in stores. God has prospered us. How many of us really do this? I'm surprised of some of the things that I hear of today. How that some members are supporting various aspects. Especially the youth ministry. I've never read in the Bible where there is a youth ministry or a youth minister. I haven't found that yet. But somehow out in California, they want to support the youth activities with car washes and raffles and bean dinners and what have you. You know, Paul gave a principle, I think, that we need to look at today. Romans 3 and verse 8, doing evil that good may come. Paul felt that he had been slandered by such a report, that a report could come against the church. Doing evil that good may come. Well, in sectarianism over the past years, we have seen bingo games to raise money for their respective churches, raffles, even traffic in liquor. One uh, church, the Catholic Church in Vallejo a few years ago, uh, during World War II, when uh, I guess liquor was hard to get, they raffled off a case of liquor. They had a big attendance at their services that day. How did they explain it? They're going to use the money for charity. They're going to use it for charity. And that seemingly would make everything right. And so people today, we can have car washes. We can have bean suppers. We can have this. Why? Oh, we're going to use it for the work of the church. Friend, the Bible never did endorse the principle, do evil that good uh, may come. It isn't true. Now come with me to another thing that we need to invest today. We need to invest opportunities. Opportunities. I like to read Ephesians 5, verse 16. Paul says, redeeming the time, redeeming the time. What does this mean? It just simply means to buy up opportunities. And so what you and I need to do today, instead of waiting for opportunities to present themselves, if one doesn't turn up, we have to go over and turn it up. 
If it doesn't come along, we have to go and make it, buying up opportunities. And right now is the time to go into the marketplace. All things are right. We need instant scripture. I think my most embarrassing moment has been a time when someone asked me a question about the Bible, and John, I didn't have the answer. In my early days of preaching, that happened a few times. Isn't that embarrassing? To be asked a question about the Bible and you don't have the answer. Well, I found out the answers naturally. But here's what I'm trying to get. We need instant scripture. 10, 15, 20 years ago, members of the body of Jesus Christ had instant scripture. You asked them a biblical question, and they were able to give you an answer from the Bible. But today, if a man asks you a question out in the marketplace, maybe you're having coffee with him in a group of other business associates, and he asks you a question about the Bible, did you know if you don't have it on your lips to give him at that instant, he may never ask it again. He may never come back your way and talk to you again about the Bible. Now, I hear many of you saying, well, only preachers can do that, or elders, or Bible teachers. Well, the Bible's such a big book, they tell me they can't learn it. Well, whoever told you that? It isn't true. Yes, the Bible is a big book. But I'm going to tell you something. Did you know freshmen in college have to read books as big as the Bible? And not only that, they have several of them. And they have to pass an examination on those books. So they have to learn those books and pass examinations. Well, the Bible, after all, isn't such a big book. Only 1,189 chapters. 31,102 verses. 3,566,480 3,566,480 letters, 773,740 words, and just 66 books. You see, the Bible isn't such a big book. It's learnable. Jesus said you can learn it. John 7, verse 17, If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Let's change our lesson for a few moments, and let's talk about the rules, the rules of business. First rule that I'd like to list is that of honesty. There are a lot of people who tell me today that you can't be honest and be in business. Well, I don't know where you can equate cheating and dishonest with business. We hear it say that, said that business and uh, religion do not mix. It isn't true. God has dominion over both. God rules each one. You can be honest and be a Christian. You don't have to expect lucky windfalls or some inheritance. You can be honest and be successful. The Bible tells us so. We have the record of young Joseph in the Old Testament. A boy who was in the house of Potiphar. And uh, over a prison... And finally, he is made head over the greatest business venture ever recorded. And not only that, he was placed over the economy of a world power. Just think about young Joseph. Then there was Paul who supported himself much of the time while he was preaching the gospel as a tent maker. Well, here is a worthy occupation. As a tent maker, he did not deal in any shady deals. Look at the record of Onesimus in Rome. And uh, Paul found that Onesimus could be useful to him, but he didn't take Onesimus away from his owner, Philemon. But he could have argued, you know, Philemon is so far away, a thousand miles. He'll never know where Onesimus is, and I can just keep him, and he can work for me. No, that isn't the way Paul reasoned. Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon and writes him a letter about this. He would not deal, practice, in any shady deals. Paul said, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now, there is a passage of Scripture, Romans 12, verse 7, 
that we ought to commit to our memory. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Well, a businessman needs to be punctual. He needs to keep his appointments. He is not to be running behind appointments. He must be punctual in keeping them. You know, another man's time is just as valuable, valuable as mine. And I have no right to make him waste that time. And then again, in the marketplace, the business community, if we do not pay our debts on time, pay our bills on time, statements, when they go out, they should go out on time. And when we fail to do that, we have ruined the confidence that that business community has in us. And so this hurts. Then also we are to be fair. We need to practice what's called the golden rule. Now, you cannot open your Bible and read those words, golden rule. But don't, don't be disappointed. You can't read your Bible and find the prodigal son, not in the text. But in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, there was a young man who took his substance and went into a far country and wasted it riotous living. Well, that young man was wasteful, and that's what prodigal means. And so we find there is a prodigal son, and there is a rule that's golden. Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. But may I remind you, this really is not man's duty to God. A lot of people tell me they're going to be saved by keeping the golden rule. Not true. This rule is man's duty to man. Nothing about baptism. Nothing about the Lord's Supper. Nothing about obedience to God. Just man's duty to man. And you know, there are many business deals that are just on the borderline between right and wrong. But if a man would use the golden rule and then apply it and walk in the shoes of others just for a little while then certainly all business deals would come out right. Then not only do we need to be punctual, not only do we need to pay our bills on time and be fair, but we need to be kind. You know, I don't have the right to be unkind to anybody. Even if I'm sick, if I'm weary or weary or uh, troubled about something, I do not have the right to be kind to anybody. And neither do I have the right to pick out the one that, to whom I will show kindness to. As God's child, as a Christian, I must be kind to every person. Be a kind one to another, said Paul. And this we must do. And now I'd like to think about another way, another rule of business. Romans 14, verse 16, Paul says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. You know, there are some people who would like to impress the world with their goodness when they really don't have any. But the Apostle Paul has in view men who are actually good, but who so live as to put men out of conceit with religion itself. What Paul is saying we need to be as careful concerning the manifestation of our religion as we are the reality of it. It's possible to be very good, and yet no one like you. There are two ways in which Christians dishonor the Lord and bring his cause to an open shame. Number one, by breaking his laws, we give men to understand that the Lord uh, uh, approves of our transgressions. Or we may permit our good to be evil spoken of. Namely, we may act upon right principles to give them bad character. Now, how do we do that? Number one, when undue stress is laid upon trifles. Undue stress is laid upon trifles. Like a few days ago, we were in a congregation and a Bible discussion, lots of people we couldn't eat in the building. Raining outside. People had to go out for miles to from building to find something to eat. 
because some people thought that the eating in the building was sinful. Well, it turned out bad. You had to go so many different places and get back for the afternoon discussion. Such a hurry. It had been a lot better to have had it in the crowd or had it in the building. And people were making remarks about it. Well, undue stress is laid upon trifles. For example, you can't take money out of a treasure and give it to an orphan child. Pay a preacher out of the treasure, but you can't pay out of the treasure for the keep of an orphan. And they go to Galatians 6 and verse 10. So we therefore have opportunity to let us do good to all men, especially the household of faith. They say now we can help orphans as individuals, but we can't do it from the church treasury. And they go to Galatians 6, 10. Well, we need to look at Galatians 6. There's verse 6 before there is verse 10. Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teaches in all good things. Now, this is the individual, the man that's been taught. How do you pay your preacher here? How do you pay? Does everybody just take it up and put it on the uh, Lord's table? And when he walks out of the building, do you just stick it, your, whatever you're going to give, just put it in his pocket? Well, I know a preacher wouldn't want it that way. he come up some Sundays missing. Uh, pay wouldn't be there. Oh, no, he won't let you do that. You're going to get my pay out of the treasury. Well, Galatians was written to churches, not individuals. Galatians 1 in verse 2, and the churches of Galatia. We may permit our good to be evil spoken of, but being centuries. The religion of Jesus Christ does not justify my harsh criticism. Jesus said, judge not, that you be not judged. And this is the way it ought to be. We're not to judge. We're not to be critical in our judgment. Now, we can certainly tell what's wrong. Brother Marshall M. Keeble, I think one of the greatest preachers that I've ever heard. Brother Keeble was talk, asked one time, is it wrong to judge? He said, look at it this way. He said, I'm a fruit taster. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them, and I taste the fruits, and I know whether or not the fruit is good or whether it's bad. Again, we may permit our good to be evil spoken of by narrowness. The world often miscalls a noble self-denial, straight lacedness, and we have to be prepared for it. Yes, we have to be prepared for it. But there is a self-denial that actually is narrow, and this prevents a man from looking calmly and boldly at religious questions and brands all recreations as conformity with the world. I hope that man will leave golf playing alone. But... All recreation is conform to the world. What's he doing? He may be a good man, but running around talking like that, all he's doing, he's causing his good to be evil spoken of. We may also cause our good to be evil spoken of by sadness. It's so easy to get a sour spirit. It makes a grand character repulsive. A man who is all laughter counts for little. But a man that lets a cheerful spirit shine through his religion does much to recommend his faith. God wants his people happy. He wants us to be radiant, extending rays of sunshine, joy, and gladness. I'll never forget some years ago in preaching in Oakland, California, this one lady liked to pick on me. So uh, she always had something to say, something for me to do. One day she said, Joe, so you ought to be out in the park talking to a bunch of those elderly people out there and telling them about Christ. Said so you're going on a vacation and said that's wrong. So the devil never takes a vacation. That gave me just the cue I wanted. I said yes, and that's why he's a devil. God doesn't intend for him to be happy, but I'm a preacher. God wants me to be happy. I'm a Christian. Well, you know, you just can't uh, run out and be happy. You have to follow certain rules. The rules for happiness. Paul was happy in a jailhouse, Philippi, Acts, the 16th chapter. He and Silas at midnight were praying and singing praises unto God, happy, after they had been beaten and whipped, put in the inner prison, feet made fast in stocks. I just wonder how many of us, if we'd been put in an old prison house, 12 o'clock at night and beaten, 
I wonder if you'd be singing praises to God or saying, hey, you jailer, and I get out of here, you're going to lose your job. I know the governor. I know this or I know that. You'll pay for it. Happy. Counted themselves worthy to suffer shame for the gospel of Christ. Happy to be counted that way. You know there are rules for happiness. What are some of these rules? You can't find happiness at the supermarket and furniture store. Happiness is not a child of circumstances. It's a child of faith. What are the rules? Philippians 4.8, Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, to be any virtue, to be any praise, think on these things. Well, if we think on good things, we'll be happy. You think on bad things, you'll be unhappy. And we have to be thankful for the common things of life. I'm thankful for the buses and the trucks that run to San Jose, California. If those trucks missed a week of running, my wife would go hungry. I'd be hungry. People in the Bay Area, thousands, millions of people, we depend upon truckers. I'm thankful for a trucker. And then when I go in the grocery store and I want to buy pork chops, I'm thankful for my butcher because if he didn't have the pork chops all cut up, marked out, price, if I had to go out, pen, and find a hog and butcher it, I'm not too sure I could find the pork chops. So I'm thankful for my butcher. He's done a good thing for me. He has them marked out, proper price, put on them. I'm thankful. I cannot allow myself to become unhappy.